Hi, I'm Keegan Flegner. I'm 17 years old and I live in Santa Monica, California. When I was in first grade, I was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. Since that time, sports have played a huge role in changing my life. So I want to show the world how all kinds of sports can help all kinds of people with all kinds of mental and emotional challenges. Welcome to Sports on the Spectrum. My guest today is Nikki Rutterer. Nikki grew up in Santa Monica, California, and like me, he loved all kinds of sports growing up. Black football, baseball, soccer, golf, and skateboarding, before eventually focusing on basketball. Nikki played in the Santa Monica YMCA Basketball League for many of the years I played there too. We played both on opposing teams and as teammates. I loved playing with and against Nikki. He was big and strong, but also very quick. Most importantly, he loved basketball as much as I did. In fourth grade, Nikki was diagnosed with ADHD, but Nikki went on to become an amazing student athlete through middle school and high school, successfully completing many AP classes and playing for his varsity basketball team at Santa Monica High School. He is graduating in 2021 and is looking forward to college. Please join me in welcoming Nikki Rutterer to Sports on the Spectrum. So first off, Nikki, I like to kind of, I always like to start my interviews uh, uh, with, at the very beginning, sort of an irony here, with your story from the very beginning. Yeah. And so my first question to you, and this is something I ask everybody first, what are your first memories of sports in general? And that can be anything. You could be watching it on TV, yeah. you know, going to a game, anything just related to sports. I've always been associated around sports. I was always like my first sport since my dad is Euro. He's from Europe. <laughs> so my first sports that I really remember actually playing is soccer. And really? Yeah. So soccer was at the very, very beginning. Mm -hmm. My dad even refed, which was kind ah. of funny. Um, okay. Yeah. So sports such as like soccer and stuff. Yep. yep. Very, very young age. Um, basketball, I didn't start getting into basketball really mm -hmm. like serious basketball was until the seventh grade really okay yeah. with the ymca right um, right right but you know i've always played the uh, like rec leagues before mm -hmm. that um i just yes. kind of just did it because i always loved sports I just right. wanted to try something new mm -hmm. yeah. it's it yeah it's, it's interesting actually this is another weird irony here my first sport also, it was not basketball, actually. Like you, it was actually soccer. Mm -hmm. And now, granted, while well, I started basketball much earlier than you did at the same time, like I think mm -hmm. I was like in elementary school and pretty early in it too. But, you know, at the same time, it's it's weird in the sense that my first sport that I remember at least playing was soccer as well. And why? Well, well, I'm not the best player at soccer, especially <laughs> not today. You know, yeah, it's, like I, it's like at the same time, I'll never forget those first memories of sports being with soccer. So. Yeah, and it's, they're also so vivid, my memories. Yes, like exactly. I still like, remember my jerseys. Yeah, um, no. Yeah, I, I still remember playing where we played. I still remember, actually, too, there was this game game we called uh, called Spaghetti and Meatballs, <laughs> where I, I forget the gist of it and all, but I remember the, the idea was the soccer balls were the meatballs and you had to score or something like that. So You know what? I think that was a pretty um, popular idea. Yeah, no, it wouldn't shock I, me. Like that's an easy thing to get uh, little kids into playing. So yeah. it's like, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if it's a common trend with other <laughs> youth soccer coaches. Um, but I guess uh, building off of that a little, going into a more of a professional or at least um, uh, common uh, ground here, you know, obviously because you were such a sports fanatic, you rooted for a lot of uh, different teams, I'm sure, who played professionally and players and stuff. And I guess I'd ask who, who and what were some of those teams and players and why was that the case? You know what? I, I as much as I love sports, I'm actually not a huge sports watcher. OK, and I never had a team growing mm -hmm. up. Right. I always based it off my friend's favorite team. <laughs> obviously, Barcelona and stuff. like Right. That. Right. But I never watched sp soccer. Mm -hmm. my, I mean, I didn't either. So it's like, you're not alone in that regard. Yeah, no, I, like I never collected cards. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't like that. Right. I didn't, like have a poster on the wall of a soccer player or soccer team. Right. And it was kind of interesting because as much as I was involved in sports, I never really had a mm -hmm. sports icon until I started playing basketball. Right. So I couldn't, I couldn't answer that question. I don't, I don't have, I didn't, hey. I never had a real team to you know listen 
Yeah, listen, everybody's got their own story. So I'm not ashamed. In fact, I'm very interested, you know, because to me, it's like every other per- every other person in this world, you know, the reason they love sports so much is because they love the the people who play it professionally, you know, and yeah. the teams and stuff. So for you to be such a sports fanatic and yet have nobody or no one person or no single team that you've looked up to your entire life for mm-hmm. that reason, it's like, that's really interesting to yeah. me. And I think it makes your your story ever more interesting. And I guess, um, uh, you know, because obviously you didn't, uh, you're not that kind of person, I guess at the same time, your best sports memories specifically for, for you, they come from what you did and not what other people did. And so I guess I'll use that to lead to my next question, which was when you were playing all these different sports, you know, again, I won't go for the list, but you know, we all know it was long and, you know, very, uh, intriguing to be playing so many at once. But I guess when you were playing all those sports, what was like some of those specific moments uh, that you were proud of or you really liked or just had a lot of fun with? Well, one of my, one of my specific moments that I was really proud of is that I was also a, kind of like a real big kid growing yep. up. Yes, and, you still are now. <laughs> and I, I loved when the coach would place me in the big positions right or like reference me to someone who was big or like mm-hmm. a monster or something mm-hmm. and uh just those little comments i just remember so well yes and, and those kind of like it, it has nothing to do with the sport itself but it's just like the, the environment that, right that was created that was uh that brings me the most memories definitely get why you would feel proud of being known as the big kid and embracing that at the same time, you know, for me, obviously, because, you know, obviously I'm not as big as you or as big as uh, a big person would probably be defined as, but at the same time, I was always very happy about my size, you know, how I was taller than most other people I knew who were my age and stuff and, you know, bigger and stuff like that. And I always felt proud of that. And while maybe I didn't always utilize it in the best ways at the same time, I, I always knew it was something to be proud of. So I'm yeah. pleased you felt the same way. And I guess, um, you know, kind of relating to that size, um, it obviously played a big role in why you eventually chose uh, to flip to, to focus on basketball specifically. But I guess I would add, you know, in addition to that, what else about basketball made you want to focus all your time and energy on it eventually? Well, I had a very good eye hand coordination. That's very and- important. And also my friends play basketball. So Fair I point. wanted to stay with my friends. And right. they eventually brought me into the sport even more. Right. Um, so it has to do with the physical aspect, but also just the emotional environment. That was right. Created. Yeah, no, there were definitely certain aspects about basketball that you can't get anywhere with any other sport. Mm-hmm. Like in seventh grade, my best friend, was gonna was joining the YMCA rec league and I said right. well, yep no I'm not do it yeah no I mean I've I've learned over the time that I've done this so far it's like usually the best things in your life come simply by irony they they're not things you've known were coming all your life they come out of nowhere so that's that's with almost everything though with science yeah. too yeah no I mean everything. I remember I, it's funny actually I, I'm not sure if you watched it but I'll or all our audience has but i'll remind them quickly when i interviewed pete arbogast who today is the radio announcer for usc football when i interviewed him a month ago or something he told me that he first got into radio broadcasting simply by chance because what happened was at uh the day there was one day where i think the dodgers and yankees were playing in the world series and there was this you know got broadcaster guy who normally does all the other college sports but it's like because everybody else in the city was uh listening to the world series he had no viewers and so mm-hmm. he he threw out and uh a, ch- a request to those who were listening including pete and said hey you know if somebody can get the world series on radio and call in you know so that all my viewers can listen to the game i would really appreciate it yeah. and and so pete was the first one to do it he called in and he gave play by play and you know while it was actually completely illegal very next day he gets a call from i think uc riverside and they're like hey we heard you and we want you to try out for this radio gig and stuff and from there it just took off so that's awesome i know yeah so but it's a it's a proving point into why you know a lot of the best things in life do not 
are not the ones you expect. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, um, you know, building off the fact that you didn't expect basketball or truthfully, I'm sure. And you, I'm sure you would agree here, all these other sports to play such an important role in your life, mm -hmm. but you know, they did. And I guess I would ask, why was that specifically the case? Um, I, I feel like they, they were, they allowed me to use my body a little bit and yeah. either, you know, just get some energy out or yeah. again, the environment, they, I have created almost all my connections through sports. Uh -huh. So the reason why these sports were such a big impact on me is, is it's also, you know, they're fun and all, but right. All my connections have been created through it and all my memories of going out and having fun and right. experimenting, you know, with new plays and failing mm -hmm. and yep. succeeding. Yep. 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 It, it's a huge life uh, teacher. Uh, it, right. It, it teaches you how to prepare yourself to be a failure and then a succeeder and right. learn from your mistakes and improve from those. Yeah. No. And I guess actually it's, it's weird. You kind of answered the next question I was going to ask, but I'll ask it anyway and see if you have anything else to add on to it, which is, you know, I, um, do you find that sports help you out? Obviously not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally and how exactly, you know, yes. it's like, I guess, do you have anything to add on to what you just answered a minute I ago? Could. I could. Um, sports also, and, and this is where it gets into like where my ADHD comes into play. Right. I like my coach sports kind of taught me how to utilize my ADHD a little bit. Right. I had an, you know, it's still an issue. Not, a, I wouldn't say an issue, but it's still a challenge today Yeah. where my coaches would say something and my ADHD would make me just it, go through one ear and out the other. Right. And it got me into some trouble. <laughs> but then it kind of, you know, going through that experiment or experience, over and over again, help yeah. me switch on and off my ADHD a little bit better. Right. So I could focus when I needed to, you know, yeah. let some steam out when I needed to. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I've kind of uh, found a similar process when playing sports in order to, in a way that helps me deal with my autism, you know, it's, it's like you said, you know, sports helped introduce you to your, all your best friends, you know, same is kind of true with me. It's like, mm -hmm. and the other thing too, was I used sports because, you know, as somebody with autism, it's harder for me to socially interact with other people. Yeah. So I use sports as sort of a way to make that easier for myself and it worked, you know, and it's, yeah. it's like, as a result, I can totally relate to why it would do the same thing for somebody like you, you know, as well as all those other things it did, which, you know, well, of course I'm not an exact replica of you. I find similar, uh, Absolutely. Uh, res results out, out yeah. of something like that. So, yeah, well, no. Me and you are, we got our connections through sports. Right, exactly. You know, I didn't know you until you came on the team. So, it's, yeah. So, it's like as a result that that's uh, how it led to all this. And <laughs> I'm very grateful for that. But um, I guess actually um, building off of that, we'll, I'll go more, foc I'll focus now some of my questions more on that specific time span when we were both uh, at the Wiley, because obviously it played such a huge role in both of our lives. But before we do that, I'd like to give a shout out to one of our sponsors. Do you own a classic Mustang, Corvette, Camaro, or Chevelle from the 1960s or 70s? Does the clock in your dash keep accurate time? Do you want to get a new clock for your car, but you don't want to pay $200, $300, or even $500 for a new clock? Well, then go to impactautopartsstore.com for a brand new quartz clock that looks identical to the original and is powered by a single AA battery. All at prices less than half that of a restored clock or a reproduction. Go to the website, impactautopartsstore.com and keep on cruising. And so now actually I want to, um, you know, like I said earlier, focus more on the time we spent together playing at the Wiley. You know, I've, I, you know, and like I mentioned earlier, and I'll say it again, and my audience can, I'm sure, understand this themselves. Uh, a lot, a lot of the guests I've interviewed, part of the reason I've done it is because they played a critical role in the development and building of the Y League. Like I interviewed Pete, who, who I mentioned earlier, both does USC football radio, but also was the creator of that league. Mm -hmm. And I also interviewed uh, Matthias James, who was one of the key members and it's, you know, and how it ran. And, and he was also one of its long time tenured coaches and referees and stuff like that. Yeah. 
And um, you, in addition to me, were also one of its longest tenured players. And so as a result of that, you know, I think we can both share a lot of memories and a lot of learning experiences from something like that. And, you know, I would just like to say too, you know, for both of us, and I'm sure you would agree here, the league acted as like, and it is sort of an escape or I, I don't, I, I guess that's accurate, you know, but it was like, it was a place where we could, you know, chill out. And it's like you said, it introduced us to our friends, you know, including each other. And it's like, as a result, we were able to find a place where we could have fun, you know, enjoy everybody else's presence, you know, play a game we loved, all that stuff, we could you be know, kids, right, exactly. We could be kids. That's, that's perfect. You know, and I actually, before I get into anything else, I want to show you something. Actually, I have a picture from w one of the years where we were on the same team together. And uh, for our listening audience, I will, uh, <laughs> I will um, try and uh, describe this as best I can. And basically, it's a picture of uh, one of the teams where we were the same member. And we have Nikki on one side here standing next to my dad who's the coach and then we have me on the other side here just standing here and with all our other teammates and yeah and i think we won the championship that year too so that was a championship winning team right there and we had but, drew uh, and miguel yeah and yeah no we had there were i i still remember some of those other guys in that picture uh We're too still really good friends with drew yeah no i mean and some of these guys yeah we still know pretty well so it's like at the same time it's not even just, you know, uh, what uh, happened then. It's what happens now, too, that mm -hmm. matters from that. And uh, I guess I'll first ask you before. So, well, since I've already done it myself, I'll, I guess I'll ask you now what uh, you took away from that experience. You know, what are your favorite memories? And also just maybe how you got involved in it, too, in the first place. I know you kind of uh, referenced that, but I guess maybe describe it a little more. Is this for the YMCA? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, to, to begin on, on my YMCA experience, my friend who had absolutely no experience with basketball, mm -hmm. me who had a few years of Marvis Direct League experience basketball for when I was like 10, maybe 10. Right. <laughs> kind of going into this league for the mm -hmm. first time, not knowing anybody was, you know, yep. not knowing anybody. Mm -hmm. But we finally came to the conclusion that some of our friends who we were unaware of are actually joining the team as yeah. also because, you know, they saw us joining. And mm -hmm. so, but the experience of staying in the YMCA, um, you know, like Steve and stuff, I've right. created, like, I mean, these are lifelong connections. Yeah. And right they've all i mean they these are the people who also reached out with better people to train me right so the ymca was kind of like a portal between right. my uh interests in basketball and serious right. interests right yeah no so, I, yeah 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 Obviously. no i mean i definitely um understand that and it's funny actually you mentioned steve although granted what i'm about to show you as little relationship to him but it's like you know not only did we grow close with you know uh the people who coached us personally and you know the people we played with but also you know our opponents it's like mm -hmm. we it's like and obviously sometimes our opponents were also our teammates at points like you for example exactly but at the same time even if we never play with them we always had we always especially for you and me who were in the league for so long we we grew to have profound respect for people like that, including Steve, who I was never coached by um, and you as well, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I I'd just like to bring out and for our, the audience members who have listened before, they'll, they'll uh, remember this, but there was one period where the Y decided over summertime uh, a couple of years ago to bring in all the best players who were in the league, which included you and me, and put them together to create one kind of super team, if you want to put it accurately, somewhat at least, and play against, uh, play as sort of a travel team. And so as a result of that, you and me got to play both together, but also with all these other guys who were, exactly. you know, previous opponents, or it's like who were all just good players and stuff. And first year, obviously, we were really good. Um, and, uh, you know, it was nice being all. But then um, after that, I remember you had to leave because you were too old at that point to stay yeah. in the league. 
But then I, at the same time, because I was young enough, I stayed. But then at the same time, very next year, I play with other guys, some of the same, some new. But I remember what happened. And here's the picture. And I have a picture to show it here or a proof, I guess, is um, my dad, who was the coach both years. Um, he decided to bring you back, not as a player, but actually as a coach that time. Mm -hmm. And so the picture I got in front of me right now is sort of similar to that first one I showed you, except this time, while I'm still a player in this picture, you're actually sitting in the corner as a coach right there. Yeah. And I just remember that was really interesting. And I remember actually he, when he first proposed the idea to me, I was like, dude, that's an amazing idea, you know? <laughs> Because it's like before, n n nothing had really ever been done like that. I think you were probably actually the first ever former player to actually come back as a coach yeah. in some way, shape, or form. So it's like, you know, I think that's what made it so interesting. But I guess um, kind of, you know, um, putting that, uh, using that to ask my next question in a way, how do you feel exactly that that league, after all those years, which included that, um, you know, how do you feel that it changed you as a person, as an athlete? And, you know, how did it prepare you for what was ahead specifically, you know, playing about continuing to play basketball in high school this time? Yeah. Well, the league, um, it showed me what I needed to improve on, which is, right. like, which is, which is a big thing. Right. Uh, I thought I was, you know, before the league, I was like, I'm, I'm so confident I'm going to make the high school team. Right. And then once you actually start experiencing the sport, you're like, damn, I need, yeah, I, know. I need to, I need to improve. Yep. And, um, but not only that, my, like people like Steve gave me confidence that I could improve. They right. were kind of like, you're going to be nobody. You're not going to mm -hmm. be anybody. You're, they're like, you're going to be a great player. You're going to be a great player. You, right. However, you do need to improve on so-and-so. Right. So it was like a good constructive good constructive criticism but right also just giving me the experience to step, yeah. step foot on a court before mm -hmm. the big the big court you know what yeah. I'm saying? yeah no i mean i definitely sort of found the that to be a similar takeaway although at the same time uh i did not incur the same result that you did at, at because of all it so that part was a little frustrating <laughs> yeah but you know at the same time i totally get what you're saying there you know um and I guess um, I'll quickly throw out a, a sort of an add on in a way, you know, what, like, I guess maybe I'll ask this, you know, what did the league do uh, for you in terms of how it uh, impacted the rest of your life, basically, not just ba basketball, but like life in general? Mm -hmm. Huh. This, that's a really good question because there's, there's so many things. Yeah. That I've, this is I've, a question where it's like, you, you know, the answer exists. You just don't know how to put it. Uh huh. And I feel like I've said this, this answer to this. I'm sure. But, but like, obviously uh, connections, but right. most importantly, it, it, I think it helped me subconsciously. Mm -hmm. I don't think I quite know what it mm -hmm. has done to me, but right. obviously there are lessons that I have learned right that i probably wouldn't have learned somewhere else right um and and experiences that taught me a lot right. of things that i probably wouldn't have learned somewhere else like probably uh how to be an actual good teammate mm -hmm. i don't think you're really aware of that when it happens right i don't think i was right um, but it's how to participate with other people and to make one team become one mind I think the YMCA did a really good job at that. Right. And that's, yeah, no. that's somewhere you, that's, that's only something you can learn through experience. You can't just. Right. Yeah, no. And I guess maybe I could phrase this a little differently. If it, if it brings anything else to your head, maybe I'll ask, what would, what do you think your life would be like without this? Uh -huh. Like what would, like, what would you not have? I would not have so much uh, at high school, especially. I definitely would not be part of the high school team. There you go. I wouldn't have probably my best friends because all my friends are playing basketball. And right. we go always, we, my friends and I got connected mm -hmm. and grew our connection through basketball. Right. So I, I wouldn't have that. And as a result, I, I, I don't know how many 
other domino dominoes would have fallen. Right. You know? Yeah. No. Um, so I think the YMCA, it, it, it created an entirely different path for me mm-hmm. that yeah. would later on keep on growing. Right. You know, wouldn't just merge into another path. It just created its own path through experience, um, lessons, you know, right. knowledge, all that was created through yeah. the YMCA. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I definitely find, fa- find that the more I look back on it, you know, the more I come to the same result that without that league, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, there was, there are so many things in my life that would not be the same clearly. Yeah. You know? So I Wait, definitely can. My cat is scratching at the door. Hold on. Okay, sure. Okay. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that cat of yours, that's just funny. He's, he's a, he's a dog, not a cat. <laughs> yeah. That's weird actually. Cause I feel like, uh, uh, this is unrelated to anything I'm talking about here, but I feel like uh, one of my one of my mom's dogs or her cats, I forget which one it was and which way it was, but I think like one of her dogs or cats when she was growing up, was, the advice or, or what she was like was just like what you said, which is like, she might've been a cat or she might've been a dog, <laughs> but she acted like the other. Yeah, yeah that's, that's also with my dog. He's, he's very cat-like. Yeah. And my cat is very dog-like. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, I can, I, can, I can laugh at that right there. Um, but I guess now, actually, um, I'll start focusing more on... Normally, I, take, I do this later, but I think because of everything that you've uh, found sports to be helpful in dealing with free ADHD, I think it's important we talk more about it now than we might have in another situation. Um, and I'll start off by asking the question I always start this part of the interview off with, which is talking about the term mental health. Mm-hmm. And basically, the question I ask is very simple, but at the same time, for every guest I've interviewed, it always uh, brings a lot of uh, attention to uh, uh, the, what they're thinking or what they're doing in the moment, which is that when you hear that term, you know, and again, I'll repeat mental health, you know, what pops into your head or I, or what does it mean to you? First of all, I think mental health is a, is a real serious um, topic that should be dealt with a lot of care. Mm-hmm. Yep. And sports in general, uh, I believe can really help strengthen one's mental health. Yeah. And especially during this pandemic. Right. A lot of people have been extremely stressed and working out is the most one of the most yeah uh, effective things you can do to alleviate stress absolutely i and, i find it that helps yeah and i think that sports can extremely help it has helped me and all my friends alleviate their stress so mental health with with the relation to sports they're, uh, they're almost like a a twin couple you know mm-hmm. like yeah Sports will automatically allevi- uh, alleviate your stress, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, no. And, and it helps kind of calm you down as a person. And that's one thing that I found interesting with my ADHD is because right. I would always kind of be bonkers, right? I'd be bouncing off the walls a little bit. And mm-hmm. sports has given me the opportunity to blow off some steam right? and kind of settle myself down a little bit, not go crazy <laughs> right yeah no and, and it's interesting that you mentioned that sports specifically has been one of your greatest stress or relievers of dealing with your adhd mm-hmm. um because obviously while uh while that's obviously very important and very true you know not just you but a lot of people as well a lot of other people as well including myself at the same time you've had to uh do a lot uh to deal with not just ADHD, but everything in your life. And I, mm-hmm. and I actually have not, it's not a timeline, but it's like, it, it's, it, it's kind of a brief summarization of what exactly you've had to uh, do. And I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, read what I can here, um, which is um, that. Um, so first of all, actually, I'd like to bring up the fact that, and I've mentioned this so many times, but I'll mention again, I didn't know I had autism until I was in first grade. Mm-hmm. So it was like until then, you know, I, I just had no clue in the world. And even after that, it's like 
you know, while I knew uh, instinctively, I didn't necessarily know subconsciously. Yeah. Like to me, it was like, okay, so what, you know, what's this do? It's, it's like, to me, it was nothing more than just, you know, uh, a, an afterthought really. Yeah. yeah. Um, but over the course of time, it definitely grew to become a more impactful part of my life, you know, yeah. as I grew to maybe not accept it, but just realize it more and maybe, you know, find ways to recognize it and just, you know, uh, use it to my advantage and even, you know, improve my weaknesses and, and kind all of that, grow around that, it. Oh yeah, exactly. All that, all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. you know, uh, with what I'm reading here, it seems like you have a similar story, but I'll, I'll give it as I understand here. So in kindergarten and starting off you per your mom, at least, uh, you said, she said you struggled with reading relative to your peers. Yeah. Um, and then in first grade, you, uh, like me, you were actually diagnosed with something, although this was not ADHD, it was a reading disorder. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I would actually quickly ask, you know, what was that exactly? So my reading disorder, it, it had, it's, um, it's something that's part of my brain that it, it, it kind of, it's hard to explain. It's right. I cannot process the words mm -hmm. as well or as efficiently. Right. So I not only have a reading disorder, but I was also diagnosed with a comprehension disorder. So mm -hmm. not only could I not really process the words, mm -hmm. I couldn't filter the words in my head after right. I read them. Right. So kind of like I can hardly read the word itself. Mm -hmm. Like the word once I read it isn't really understood. Right. So that was a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And I definitely sort of in some ways actually relate to that latter part, which that you said right there, which is that even after I've read it, you know, it's not that I don't understand it. It's just like, I want to full, I feel like there's something left to be desired. Uh -huh. So it's like, at the same time, I'll read something over again, exactly. just, be just because I feel like I, I haven't fully achieved everything I want to from it. So exactly. And, and sometimes if I'm reading something, it doesn't make sense. I have to reread right. it again right. and again. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely get where you're coming from with that. And then, you know, it's like at the same time, it's not necessarily something you can explain, but at the same time, you just know it's there. Exactly. It's, it's very difficult to explain to someone who's never experienced. This right. Story. You know, this is something where you you have to see it or experience it to believe it. You know, yeah. it's, it's like, until that happens, you're never going to be satisfied in a way uh -huh. that, you know, you'll, I'm not going to say don't show sympathy, but it's like, don't know how to relate. Exactly. That kind of thing. And so I guess I'll um, keep uh, re uh, reading off the timeline I have here. So, you know, in first grade, you were diagnosed with that reading disorder. And then second grade, and this actually happened to me too. This is basically a program for everybody who's on the spectrum in general. It's like has autism, has ADHD, all that stuff. You went to the IEP, which stands for Individualized Education Program. And I guess I would also actually quickly ask just for our audience's sake here, you know, can you describe what that was like? Yeah, my IP was a very, so I had later on, I think the timeline splits into different IEP, but right. my first IEP, as mm -hmm. I will refer it to, was an IEP around giving me extra time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really designed to improve on my skill, on my uh um, my needs because later on in time we would find something different right or find something new I would just say right but my first IEP since I was only diagnosed with the reading disorder mm -hmm. I was given additional time on subjects lessons and so I could finish them right and uh, it would be my my counselor or whoever mm -hmm. was helping me would pull me out of class every day, right? sit me down somewhere and we would just do the lesson plan. I would always mm -hmm. take my tests in a different room so right. I could finish them. I would always yeah. study in a different room or just do an assignment in a different room outside of the, the uh, classroom because I was always at a different place at a different pace. Right. And my teachers was, would also give me different lessons, lessons mm -hmm. that would be easier for me to complete. Right. 
and that's yeah, no. yeah that's how it was that's how it first looked mm-hmm. my first iep right yeah no i mean I obviously did not have an identical experience, but at the same time, there were definitely aspects like being pulled out to take tests in a different room Mm -hmm. that I uh, had a a similar experience with. And, you know, it's not that I didn't appreciate that. You know, it's, it's just like, these are things that you don't necessarily take into account until later in life. Exactly. I I had no idea that this was kind of only me who was doing it. Yeah, no, I just thought it was, they're so young, you know, it's like, and you don't care really about that stuff at the same time. My head's associated with sports at the time, you know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, exactly. Definitely. You know, like I'm more worried about how the Clippers are going to win the championship <laughs> than how I'm going to uh, win this test or whatever. Do really exactly, well. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. But um, I guess uh, moving forward uh, on the timeline uh, now in fourth grade, and I mentioned this earlier to our audience, but I'll remind them again. It was in fourth grade that you were finally diagnosed with ADHD. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'll quickly actually also, um, I, I, I think I mentioned this in my previous episode with Kurt Schwengel, but for those of us who didn't listen, I'll repeat it again. ADHD is one of the most common de- neurodevelopmental disorders of childhood. It's usually first diagnosed in childhood and often lasts into adulthood. Children with ADHD may have trouble paying attention, controlling impulsive behaviors, may act without thinking about what the result will be, or maybe overly active. And so I guess maybe actually I'll, I'll quickly ask, and you don't necessarily have to answer, have an answer because I wouldn't have one to my kind of question here, which is when you first found out about that, what was your reaction? It was a very, uh, it, it brought a lot of weight off my shoulder. Okay. Because my family and I finally understood right. what was needed. I yeah, know. Um, it's kind of like we were sorting through a whole box of junk before and not f- understanding what we needed to find. Right. And once I was finally diagnosed, it's kind of like that key that you found yeah. in the junk drawer. Right. And it's, it just, we could finally figure out what we needed to do mm-hmm. to, to go forth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually spe- uh, speaking of knowing how to go forth then, uh, the very next year in fifth grade, it says here that you began prescription medication for mm-hmm. ADHD. And you, per your mom, uh, again, she says that once you start taking that medication, she says that's when you were able to blossom. And I guess I would ask, you know, well, first of all, like how accurate is she there? And second of all, what do you think about like uh, what the medication did for you? I think the medication actually saved my life in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, like, for example, once I was in sixth grade, I was at a reading level, at a, at a third grade level, or third okay. grade reading level. So I was three years behind. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, my medication allowed me to focus. It really brought forth my abilities to actually mm-hmm. be a good student. It didn't, it, I don't like when people call it uh, your smart pills. Right. It's not, it's not, it's not. <laughs> this pills that are making you smart. It's you right. being able to use the medication to be who you really are. Right. And that it, it kind of allowed me to become the student I always wanted to be. Right. And I'll reference this. I became, let me, let me say this again. I was at a third grade reading level. at right. sixth grade. Once right. I was in eighth grade, I was at the English HP level. Wow. I was at the honors eight level. There you go. So I was going out through my entire elementary school struggling mm-hmm. until I had my medication. Right. Brought force to the table, my attention. Right. Able to actually do stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. And another part of this, uh, it's funny you mentioned that earlier. Another part of the, the uh, of this timeline that, is mentioned is uh, the fact that during the, your middle school years in sixth day of grade, you actually took supplemental reading classes specifically to catch up there. And also um, it says you also took some occupational therapy for uh, your writing skills too. Yeah. You know, like, I, I guess I would just quickly ask like, what, what did that do? Like, uh, <laughs> like the medication did one thing and I'm not saying medications for everybody. Like mm-hmm. it, it varies, you know, yeah, and obviously, exactly. you know, 
it's up to you to figure out what works for you because you are you. Mm -hmm. Um, but in addition to the medication, what did those sort of things like those, that therapy and those classes, what did that do for you? Yeah. So these were classes that literally took an entire class period. Right. And I would have, um, I had them for three years and these mm -hmm. were classes specifically based off Influ um, enhancing my reading and comprehension abilities right. obviously my writing too mm -hmm. and we would do a lot of very basic drills yeah. that at that point in time you don't really realize what they're doing to you mm -hmm. and it's literally sorting through the vowels of a word that's right. that's one of them but what doing that for three years straight mm -hmm. it uh, it trains you to efficiently read and, and comprehend that word. Yeah. So we would do reading passages and mm -hmm. timed reading passages and see how far we could get. And right. we always graphed our words. Yeah. Like how many words we read in that minute. Mm -hmm. And you could see from my sixth grade to eighth grade, it, it kind of goes up in a linear line. Right. So it's, it's just so interesting to see. Yeah. No. And actually going back to your part about the medication for a second and how it doesn't make you smart, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's you who makes you smart. I actually have a, a little bit of irony for our audience here. So for those who don't know, I'm actually a big fan of the show family guy. And there's an episode where the baby in that show, he takes the, uh, his teacher actually prescribes him to take these pills because they think he's uh, overly active like you like they think he has ADHD basically and so they ask and so they have him take these pills to basically calm him down but it but what happens is and the other thing too is the baby in addition to being overly active he's really really smart like he invents time time machines and stuff but what the pills do is they basically have him chill like be super slow super you know everything like he's just like the he's like a sloth basically <laughs> And then meanwhile, uh, the, at the same time, the dog in the show, who's pretty dumb, at least by most people's standards, um, even though he thinks he's a genius, he decides to take, I'm not sure if they're the same pills or different pills that um, then make him become overly active. Uh -huh. Basically, they make him go like crazy. And so then he starts doing all this crazy stuff super fast, you know. <laughs> And eventually it gets to the point he creates this like magical fantasy <laughs> world and takes it to George R.R. R. Martin, who I think is the creator of Game of Thrones. And he's like, oh, you're going to love this. And then George R.R. R. Martin is like, dude, this is just a bunch of stuff. It's not good. <laughs> you know, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah no. And, and that's when they realize it's like these pills aren't doing anything to us. They're not making us smarter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they're just making us overly active or super calm. So it's mm -hmm. like and it's interesting. The pill it makes my body calm but my head can i feel like i can turn my gears much smoother right but as a result i can also get like super focused and right everything is i can do a billion things at a time but right on the outside i look like i'm very calm right exactly no and if that's what it can do to somebody like you that's a that's a win yeah and then the last part, actually, and this and this, again, uh, a comparison here, because I, I did this myself uh, at the same time, no less, which was in 10th grade, you completed your IEP yep. that I mentioned earlier, you know, and had a lot of success in that clearly. Um, and then you transferred to a 504 plan, mm -hmm. which is something I did, too, because while I wasn't necessarily as invested in IEP as you were at the same time, I I, I fat figured out basically that I was going to need some assistance because I was, you know, struggling to complete tests and stuff like that, just because yeah. I didn't have enough time and stuff. And so I transferred to the 504. And, you know, since then, it's played a huge role and given me more time. And I guess I would add, you know, what did that do for you as well, in addition to what it did for me? Yeah, yeah. Really quickly, before I state that, I just want to say that in fifth grade, I, 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 I got a new IEP. I okay. was given a new IEP because I figured out or I was diagnosed right, with right, right. ADHD. Right. And so in fifth and 10th grade, I then graduated out of that one. Right. And what that did to me, it because graduating out of your IEP is something that isn't very common. Right. And it's also in college, 
you're not given an IEP. You're only given a 504, right. which if people don't know, it's you're just giving additional time. Right. Yeah. Like it's just basically, it's like a, it's, I'm not, it's, it's not a, like a, uh, a free pass or anything like that because it's designed for people like you and me who actually need it because we're in some way developmentally challenged or not in a way that affects how we perform academically. Yeah. But you know, what it does basically is it gives us tricks to help us deal with that Mm -hmm. is the way I'd put it. Yeah, exactly. And what that did for me is it, it, just brought to the table it showed me how much i i i my my abilities that i am mm-hmm. not who i previously thought i was as a kid right you know, thinking i was kind of like the the bottom of the barrel before mm-hmm. i was put on this iep program right I, I, just graduating out of this kind of gave me a moral boost right you can mm-hmm. you could say it's yeah no like, wow I, I really did that i completed something that affected my life for decades well i'm sorry not decades because i'm not <laughs> yeah no you've all you've been alive for less than two decades man yeah Get it I'm, together. I'm currently only 18 <laughs> right um but yeah for well over a decade right yeah there you go yeah yeah no that 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 that, that definitely is um something worthy of considering it's like it doesn't even take that much time even if it is a decade to mm benefit from stuff like this so you know that's that's the lesson in it all i guess is you know as long as you're you give stuff a chance you'd be surprised Mm -hmm. how quickly it works um i guess now i want to talk more specifically about you know your adhd by itself like what it was like for you when you weren't taking medication and even if you were it's like what does it's my question uh, i'll just say now what does it do to you how does it affect you you know and it's like uh, what does it make a difference now, uh, compared to what it was then, you know, yeah, yeah. like, and, and like also just, I'll, I'll, I'll add, well, I'll, I'll let you answer that first and then I'll ask uh, some additional aspects to the question. Mm-hmm. So my ADHD has always been a very, a big road roadblock and in, in just mm-hmm. getting work done and being productive. And right. today, since I'm a little more mature, I mm-hmm. hope yeah, <laughs> I was I'll do. Then. Um, and since I've actually been influenced by my medication, I, I know what to do right. to, to better deal with my ADHD, especially when I'm not on my meds. But uh, taking not taking my meds, it's very difficult still. It, I can't really get work done unless I take my meds on the weekend. Right. And especially if I'm at school, that's right. it's just, it's a painful experience just sitting in class when I know that it's right. a very important class. I know that I have the ability to take notes. I'm just out of it. Yep. No, I, I it is out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Those, there's nothing you hate more than uh, things like that, that, you know, you can control. You just can't control it's, at the moment. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah. No, it's like, it's like you, you know, everything you need to do, you just don't have the tools to do it. And it's kind of like, it's just like my head is out of the game. Right. My, I'm not focused at all. Um, the class is kind of like, I just want to be on my phone, play games yeah, and do some sports. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, if, if I'll, I'll throw off a quick metaphor here, it's like having the instructions to do something, but not the tools. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's like, I, I definitely understand how that, how that feeling, not only is it frustrating, it's incredibly aggravating. It's, it is. It really is. You know, because it's like you want to be able to have the tools and do this. It's not that you don't want to do this. You do. It's uh-huh. just you don't. You just can't, you know? Yeah. It's like no matter how easy it seems, it's like you're just missing that one little piece that mm-hmm. would change everything, you know? Exactly. It, and it's, it, it's like with a puzzle. It's like a puzzle is not complete until you have every piece. Absolutely. You know? And that's the, the yes, yes, absolutely. And that's where that medication comes in for me. It completes right. the puzzle. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I guess I would add on now, you know, it's like, obviously the medication is something you do all the time. You've made that clear. But it's like, you know, how often necessarily, at least based on what you know, how often do you think your ADHD um, uh, comes up? And also, like, are there any specific scenarios in which it might, might be more prevalent? Yeah. You know? So ADHD, it's really interesting. You ADHD is 
it, it allows me to um, only focus on stuff that I want to focus right. on. So in class, obviously most kids don't want to be in school. So mm-hmm. by default, my body is like, I want to be in, I want to be on the field. I want to be on the court. I want to play video games. But then right. when I'm in video games, it's almost like I have already taken my meds, but I'm right. not. No. I'm super hyper focused on my phone, the controller, the video mm. game itself. Yeah. And it's interesting because people are like, ADHD makes you go crazy in general, but it's only with things that you don't want to do. Yeah. And when you when you're when your ADHD is acting up and you're focusing on something that you want to do. Uh-huh. You're like a normal person, if not more hyperactive or, or more focused on the subject than most other people. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I, I get that feeling. It, and it's weird. I feel, I think that part you mentioned about video games, I think that's why video games are so successful at what they do. Exactly. They, you know, even for people like you, they make you focus, you know, mm-hmm. in a way that you want to focus. Right, it, right. It's like, yeah. People don't want to be doing their homework. <laughs> no, no, they don't. They want to, you know, be on their phone, be on their, you know, console, just playing video games. It's, it's, it's like, and when you're playing video games, they focus, you know, because they want to focus. Exactly. And, so. and really quickly, I just want to add on, I, I cannot be in sports with my meds active. Really? Yeah. My, why, why is that the case? For me, it's, um, I kind of use my ADHD as an advantage because mm-hmm. I'm hyperactive, I'm hyper focused on the right. sport and nothing else. I'm my body is uh moving like crazy. I'm ready to pump up some steam. Uh-huh. And again, I'm using it to my advantage. I'm right focusing on the court, but that, that that could also be an issue because I may not focus on the coach, <laughs> which is another thing. Like I'm focused on playing the game. Right. I don't, I don't want to hear any in- instructions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, I, I can understand that. Like, you know, it's like for me, I don't wear my glasses when I go playing basketball. Cause it's like, you know, they're just going to keep falling off anyway. So it's, exactly. it's, it's kind of like a case where it's like, you know, uh, it, it's a case where it's like this, things like this work for everything else, except that, you know, that's why I wear contacts. <laughs> Yes, I've not tried contacts yet, but we'll see. You know, those are um, lifesavers. What? Those are lifesavers. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, or I'm happy that you consider them lifesavers. <laughs> you know, yeah. But we we all make our own choices. Um, um. But I guess um, I'll ask a sort of a different kind of question now. And this focuses more on um, uh, how other how you feel about other people knowing about this, like. This it, this question kind of I think relates to what we're doing right now, which is, you know, how do you um, tell other people that you have ADHD? Do you do it proactively? Do you only do it when you're asked? Do you not? You know, it's like, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, what does it mean to you to let other people know that you have ADHD? And you know, I guess I would also ask, like, in the times that you've done it, what what are maybe some common trends you see from people who react? Yeah, yeah. So if um... I really only just say it when I need to, or right. in the case that, you know, someone is a really good friend of mine, right. Close to me. And I'll, I'll just ex- explain to them what it is, but usually people will notice it a little mm-hmm. bit and yeah. then I'll have to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so my friends, for example, have always been friends. I've always been friends with them since elementary school. Right but really, really good friends since, uh, since high school. And they've, yeah. they've always noticed my, um, I mean, ADHD come up right. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting for me. If I'll just cut you off for a second. I actually did not know you had ADHD until uh, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, really? Yeah. No. And, I, and I'm not offended in any way. Yeah. It's just, you know, it, it's it, I, I guess maybe it's more of a show as to how well stuff like the medication works for you yeah yeah and sports you know? yeah no i think my sports can kind of hide it a little bit because i'm focused on right sport. exactly I'm actually, I'm actually focused right yeah no <laughs> but yeah i don't usually say it 
if I don't have to. It's just right. kind of like if it if something comes up where I'm a little hyperactive, right? I'll either mention it or, you know, I just if someone asks, yeah, no, I'll just let them know. Yeah, no, I mean, I I I take pretty much the exact same approach when dealing with my autism. You know, it's like I'm not somebody who. I'm, I'm not somebody who wants to brag about it, you know, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I'm, I'm perfectly capable of admitting it, you know, yeah, no, and so- being, and being, you know, um, proud of it and happy that I, about it, you know, cause it, it's part of who I am, yeah. but at the same time, I'm not somebody who wants to stress over it for my entire life. You know, mm-hmm. that to me is, is a waste. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, no, I definitely think so. And, um, so now actually I kind of want to sort of not connect, well, both connect the dots, but also try and maybe uh, not just with sports, but also just with everybody else who has to deal with this stuff in, you know, when uh, they uh, go through something like this. But before I do that, I want to give a shout out to another one of our sponsors. Are you looking to boost your SAT score by at least 360 points? Whether your goal is the SAT, ACT, AP classes, or general test preparation, turn to Sam's Tutoring Company. Sam is a Caltech-educated tutor with over 17 years of experience teaching over 700 students of all ages. Whether you want to learn in person or remotely, Sam is ready to help you accomplish your academic goals. Call Sam's Tutoring Company. If you mention the promo code SPORTSPECTRUM, you'll receive 25% off the price of your first session. So now, actually, the first question I want to ask you here in regards to putting, but connecting your story with the story of others, I guess is an, as a, another good way to put this, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things that is interesting about all this stuff that we're talking about, you know, dealing with mental and developmental, cha- mental health and developmental health challenges is that every situation is unique. You know, it's like, we all have our certain issues. We all have our certain challenges in regards to this stuff, you know, no, no two people are the same. And, um, and so also every person may have a dis- different solution to it. Like you mentioned, you deal with medication, right. um, and sports, you know, I don't use medication for my asthma skin, but I do use sports, you know, like you, as right. well as other things like pacing, stuff like that, you know, it, it just helps, you know, right. and everybody has their own way of, uh, finding a way to make things easier for them when, when, uh, dealing with stuff like this. Exactly. And, um, you know, I think, um, and it's weird actually, because I'm now realizing I, I sort of asked you this earlier, but you know, I guess I'll just, I'll put it in a different word. So maybe I can get a different answer out of you. You know, your medication and sports have played a huge role in dealing with your ADHD, you know, and I'm sure other people can relate to that in some way, shape or form, because obviously you're not the only person who does it this way, but at the same time, there are other people who do it different ways. But I guess uh, for you specifically, you know, uh, you mentioned how the medication helps you focus. It helps you, you know, stay on top of things. It, it helps you prevent yourself from, you know, not doing something, yeah. you know, when you want to, but just can't. Mm-hmm. But I guess I would ask, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I guess maybe I'll ask that, uh, the question I asked you earlier, but in, uh, in a different way, you know, without this stuff, you know, without these tools and, you know, coping me- mechanisms. It's like, what exactly, what exactly would you be like? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say that in a different way, but I can, I can definitely add on to this. It's um, like right now I have mm-hmm. not taken my meds, but right. I'm focused. I'm really, I'm focused on this interview. Because right. It's, it's interesting to me. Right. And, yeah, and if I were to otherwise be on my meds, Mm-hmm. I could probably be the same right. or I could be a little bit more into, you know, like uh, my head's a little more focused or something, but right. um, if like this were to be a, a school session right now, right. And I, and I wouldn't want to be in, in the session, right. I would be on my phone or mm-hmm. doing something else because right. it's not what I want to do. And my yeah. focus would shift to something that I want to do. Right. Yeah. And then there's this misconception with ADHD. It's like, you're always not focused. No, you're focused on stuff you want to do. Right. And it, and it's actually really interesting. You mentioned that. Cause I actually have another picture here to show you, you know, obviously you said how there are fit, there are certain things that do make you focus where you don't require medication. You don't require sports, stuff like that. 
you know, one of those things, and this is kind of specific for me and for you, just because we did this together, but, you know, I still think there are other people who can understand this. One of the things, and I, I don't know if you took your medication for this or not, but I'm sure you would agree. You could have probably been okay without it. One of the things we did together one time as a nice little outing is a couple of years ago, we went to go see the Blue Angels uh-huh. in Miramar near San Diego. And I actually have both this picture from that day. And this is you and me right here. And I have the tickets in my hand <laughs> right there. We were having a blast. But one of the advantages to specifically those tickets I'm holding there, because I remember actually at the time my dad was dating a woman who had done a documentary on um, uh, two former fighter pilots um, in the U.S. Uh, Air Force. And it was because of one of those pilots that we were able to get really good, first of all, get really good seats yeah. to see the the air, sh- see the Blue Angels themselves, as well as the rest of the planes and stunts that were there. But at the end, the biggest winner uh, advantage to having those tickets was at the end of the show, we actually got to take a picture with the Blue Angels themselves right here. So I remember that so well. Yes. Yeah, basically, for those of us from my audience who's just listening, this is ba- that picture I showed is basically a picture of me, you, and my dad, because all three of us went together to the show. And basically, standing on each side of us are the the people who fly the the planes, actually, in the Blue Angels, the, the pilots themselves. And the jet and, in the background. Yes, and we're all and we're all standing in front of one of the 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 jets them itself. So. And we got, and yeah, we, that came as a result of both having those tickets. And so after the show, we got to do that and stuff. And it was a really fun day. I remember a, a lot about it. Um, we also went to the Harlem Globetrotters. Yes. Yes. That was another thing. I do not have pictures from that, but I do remember that. Yes. We also got we to have, go see. I have a video of one yes. of the men taking your spoon. No, no, no. Yeah. Taking your straw. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it myself because I remember it perfectly. Another thing we did one time was we went to go see the Harlem Globetrotters and we got, re- and once again, although this was just a result of my grandmother willing to spend the money was we got some really good seats right near the court. And one of the things for those who have not seen them, one of the things I like to do is they like to have fun off the court as well. So like, they'll like to go into the audience, get the crowd involved and stuff. And what happened was one of the guys, he, um, he first went behind us and got somebody's pizza and literally ate a piece (laughs) off of it without his consent whatsoever, you know? And so then he comes walking around the back and, you know, at first I'm not, I don't, uh, I'm not thinking twice about it. I'm just amazed by the fact he's so close to us. You know, that to me is the, the coolest thing ever. And then, and you know, while he's doing that, I have the soda in my hand cause I'm, I'm, I'm drinking it. And out of nowhere, he just comes around and comes right towards me and just snatches the soda right out of my hands. And I'm speechless that uh, when that happens, I, I, I can't say anything, you know, and I wasn't upset or anything. I was just laughing. I was just like, why did you do that? You know, and he just takes a sip and he's like, sorry, I, sorry if I spit on it and all. You know? <laughs> that would not be accepted for today. No. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, you're right, actually. Yes. Yeah, no. But at the time, I, I just I was laughing, you know, so hard. And, and, and yes, you're right. You did get a video of that. I remember. I yeah, no. And. Yeah, that was uh, that was hilarious. But once again, I think that's another example, you know, trying to bring all this back to what I mentioned in the first place, which is that these are things that it's like, while, you know, there are other things like being in school that you need your medication for, you know, and and stuff like that, as well as other people who deal with this stuff. At the same time, there are other things that aside from medication, aside from playing sports or just experiences in general, where it's like, you don't need that stuff to have a good time, you know, or be focused or stuff. Because, you know, I think that's the wonder of everything is like, there are certain things in this world. It's a, it's like finding your purpose. It's like, there are certain things you're just destined to like, or destined yeah. to do, yeah. you know? And it's like, you don't need it uh, to uh, help to do it or to enjoy it and stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, I definitely think that's uh, something I've, I found to be uh, especially helpful in dealing with my autism. And I'm sure for a lot of other people, they can definitely f- figure out what that thing is for them that makes them happy. And just, exactly. you know, as well as other stuff that, you know, it's like, well, they will certainly enjoy, even if they deal with these challenges. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Um, but I, I guess, um, 
trying to shift gears a little bit here, you know, um, how, um, and also trying to uh, build a bigger picture here overall, how exactly did stuff like sports um, and, you know, taking this medication and stuff, how exactly, um, well, I guess I'll actually take away, forget the medication part because I actually want to focus on sports here. How exactly did sports help you better understand and address your challenges with ADHD? Because we actually haven't talked about that that much. Mm -hmm. So ADHD, basically, um, I always, my parents always knew that I was a little more active and hyper, hyperactive than a lot of the other kids. Right. And sports kind of allowed me to use my hyperactiveness mm -hmm. and apply it to something. Right. But I was also, again, focused on the sports because that's what I wanted to do. Right. Uh, but obviously, as a kid, you know, every kid is kind of crazy. So, mm -hmm. yeah, being an additional craziness on top of my crazy was a lot to handle. Right. So, so throwing me into sports kind of let me throw off my steam a little bit. And but in terms of lessons, mm -hmm. uh, I think a recent recent sports kind of with like basketball in general, right. where focusing on the coach is a huge part of the game yep and um when i first started getting into really serious basketball and and even with 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 jim as my coach right uh, i remember actually getting thrown out of one practice before because i was not focusing mm -hmm. and that's because i only wanted to shoot the the the, the ball that's all right. i wanted to do yeah um so lessons like that were i right. have to take into the, to consideration that I know that my ADHD is active, mm -hmm. but then I have to kind of switch it off. Right. I have to, I have to mask it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm forcing myself to, I know I have to focus. I know right. this is the time. Yeah. And it's important and it's right. an important time to focus. So sports definitely 100% taught me a little bit better mm -hmm. how to, how to do that. Yeah. No, it, it's, it, it, it's to me, I'll, I'll bring up a quick analogy here. It's like when dealing with uh, taking the last shot in a game, it's like, is this, you know, you in your mind, you really want to do it. But at the same time, you don't know necessarily if you can do it. You yeah. Know? And it's and it's like at the same time, you've got to ask yourself the question, am I capable of this? And, you know, what do I need to do to be capable of it? It's, mm -hmm. it, it's like these are the things you need to realize often on the fly no less like you know yeah. i've i i totally agree in the sense that there have been moments in my life where i've had to you know in your words mask my autism just because i knew what the situation i was in at the time was very important and that it would not help me in any way if i showed off my autism mm -hmm. and so while obviously that's not easy to do you know i'm not saying any of this is easy at the same time i think it's a true testament to it basically in, in some ways, actually, this might be, this might be one of the benefits of having to deal with this stuff. It makes you realize just how much you want something, you Exactly. Know? you know, it's like for other people, it's like, it's, it's as hard as ever to know if they really want something because they, they don't have any uh, stick to measure. Exactly. But for us, it's like, if we have the capacity to not ignore, but like, you know, like you said, um, do uh, make an effort to, you know, hide our, our, uh, ADHD or autism or whatever to somebody or something that matters or for that per reason, it's like, then we know it's like, okay, maybe this is something actually that's worth, worth our time and our energy because it's, it's clear if we're willing to do this for it. It's clear we like it or we want to be a part of it in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I guess, um, you know, obviously you're somebody who often has to be not victim, but it's like, you're the person who has to try and do the, the tough part or try and fit in and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I guess I would ask, it's like in your time as, you know, an athlete and as even a coach and just a, uh, a person in this world, it's like, have you ever come across other people that, you know, personally who've, who, where you believed they had to deal with this type of stuff, you know? And, um, basically, um, what, uh, what did that make you think of them? You know, what did you see in them? What, did, what were they, you know, basically maybe even describe them a little, what were they good at? You know, what stood out to them for you? And, yeah. you know, if it helps you too, you can actually use me as an example. 
I was actually going to use you as an example. Because, well, there you go. It all uh, works out. I haven't actually really had another person that I've either coached or had a teammate that had the same issues or I wouldn't say issues. They're not issues. No. Yeah. They're, challenges. Ch- they're, they're, ch- they're challenges. Put it that yeah. way. The same challenges because I don't know. There's never, they've never come across other than as a few. Yeah, no. Uh, and I mean, maybe it did. It's just, it wasn't as easy to see, you know? Exactly. And I even, I even could see that with you that, yeah, I kind of saw that you had to either turn it on and off at, at certain times. Right. When it was game time, you, you were focused and ready and that mm-hmm. you were, you know, head in the court. And right. You also had kind of taught me a little bit of the same thing, because obviously hearing from you and your dad, your stories, I could also kind of relate to them in, in mm-hmm. certain aspects, obviously, not, right. not, not on the overall stories, because we have two different challenges. But um, right. Yeah, no, that, yeah. that I don't, I don't really know how I could describe this. It's kind of just, uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's just like you said with that, you know, that reading disorder, you can't describe it. You can only yeah. see it to believe it, to uh-huh. truly understand it, you know, and it's interesting too, actually, because I, I agree with you in the sense that I'm almost two different people when I'm on and off the court, like mm-hmm. when I'm on the court, I'm locked in and like, you know, I, in some ways I'm maybe the meanest guy you can meet. Yeah. You know, whether you're my opponent or my teammate, just because it's like, I so, I so want to do well. I so want to win. It's like, it's all, all that's all that stuff. You know, it's like, it's like, it's at the top of my brain when I'm in a game, but like when I'm off the court, you know, it's like, I'm one of the nicest guys you can meet. It's just like, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I kind of wanted to copy that a little bit. I remember that it's, it's, uh, for me, look, having someone, you know, having someone who, who's in your environment that, that you can look up to in a sense Mm -hmm. uh, gives you a sort of motivation to be better as a person right like as a better in this instant a better um teammate Mm -hmm. and seeing you turn into a a more efficient player when Mm -hmm. it was time to become a more efficient player kind of made me want to become sort of like that yeah and it teaches you how to Mm -hmm. become just yeah. like that a more efficient player yeah i guess what i before i move on i would quickly um just add another aspect to this it's like maybe could you potentially list off any of the specifics you know just to maybe give our audience kind of a uh, an idea of what you, what exactly you're they should look for or maybe what should, they should expect you know or at least take away from what you had to deal with in a more visual way yeah um so is this just like with the sports and the ADHD or? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, 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 you know, it can be related to me. It can be related to you. It can be related to sports. It's like just in general. It's like, what's what's a good um, like what's a more uh, what's a way to put this in a picture, basically? Like, how would you draw illustrate this? How would I illustrate this? I'm going to try to look look at this in terms of more of a timeline. If you were to <laughs> illustrate this, it would go from. Uh, you know, that's kind of an interesting question. <laughs> it would go from, I would say, a high speed car to a car that is more, I don't know. Um, I would say a high speed car on ice. Okay. To, so like when it tries to stop, it can't stop. Yeah. So that's okay. Me, that's me as a, as a kid, a, a speeding car slipping out on ice and then going through a tunnel and then coming out as a, an electric flying jet. How about that? There you go. Yeah. It's like you, it's you're super suddenly dirty, super yeah. nice. Yeah. And uh, I have no idea if that's a good, <laughs> if that's hey, a good you know, <laughs> it's not necessarily whether it's good or bad. It's like, it's a case where it's like, what does it do specifically? Yeah. You know? And it's just like, how can you best address that? You know? Mm-hmm. Because at the same time, you know, the, the most important thing here is this is not something that's your fault yeah. and you shouldn't be blamed for it. But at the same time, you know, it's important to recognize what it does to you and what mm-hmm. you can do to uh, fix, not fix that per se, but like make it easier. You know? Yeah. And all, all my entire life experience isn't around uh, getting going, going. How do I say this? undoing my challenges it's 
you can't just run away from them. Right. It's like, I just had to learn how to be a different person, how mm-hmm. to uh, use my environment a different way. Right. Outside of the norm mm-hmm. to become as, and even more efficient. Right. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. You know, to me, it's always been when, you know, trying to figure out a way to use my autism, autism to either, you know, not make it as prevalent or maybe use it more, uh, uh, to my advantage, you know, I always try to make it so that it's more efficient in the sense that, you know, either it's harder to recognize it at one single point, or yeah. maybe it's, it's much, uh, it's much more useful at one single point, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, you, you got to find a way to find the right, uh, place where mm-hmm. everything can work in your favor. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes it doesn't, and then you still have yeah. to figure out what, what to do. Yeah. And it, once you, once you experience enough of that, you mm-hmm. can, you can learn how to, uh, use that for the future. Cause not everything is going to be lined up for you. No, it's, it's going to be not even for the, the average person. And we're going to have to, obviously we do work twice as hard just to do the same thing in right. certain in certain aspects to get mm-hmm. to get some things done right is but but over time we learn how to better do that yeah no it just becomes a norm for us yeah no i i mean it, again it's like you know it's it's like when learning something like how to play basketball really well yeah. it's like to the to the average person you're like how in the world can you do this and it's like well you just grow used to it you know yeah and, it's just, and you can't explain it <laughs> no no you can't necessarily explain it it's just natural I, at that point. And it's just like, you know, Hey, if you really, if this really is, uh, amazing to you, thank you. But at the same time to me, it's not, you know, Yeah, yeah. but it's like, at the same time, that part doesn't really matter to me as long as I like doing it. Exactly. So, you know, mm-hmm. all right. Well, um, I guess I'll wrap things up here and ask you the final question. I ask all my guests when, whenever they come on here and that's that, um, you know, lot obviously there's been a lot of progress made over the years like it's a lot easier to talk about this stuff now than it would be even just a couple of a few years ago and obviously also a lot of progress has been made on how to deal with this stuff you know obviously i i mean i bet money probably it's like if you were if you had to deal with this like 10 or even you know 20 years ago it's like you would not have the same uh exactly uh, uh coping mechanisms at your at your disposal it's like you would have to find different ways which are obviously not wouldn't be as easy yeah you know and as a result you would just struggle more in general and so mm-hmm. obviously that makes you living now all the more better yeah um and also you know people have gotten a lot better about you know dealing with the stuff being more open about it you know recognizing that it exists you know finding ways to um accept it you know and make it an integral part of uh, life humanity itself and society yeah um but at the same time you know there are still things that we don't know Mm -hmm. um there are still people who don't appreciate this or don't know what it is or how to deal with it and stuff you know and that's not their fault again necessarily it's just it means they need a little help basically to find a way to deal with this and i guess um I'll ask you to be that help here and um, ask the question, you know, if there's anything you want anybody listening or watching this to uh, take away, you know, the, you know, anything they should carry on with them for the rest of their lives, basically in relation to everything we've talked about so far, you know, what is that exactly? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's uh, people, who, you know, people who struggle from ADHD, the, the numbers are going up and up and up. Right. And I'm just going to say that if you have some of these struggles that we were talking about, it's not, you know, you're not, don't think of yourself as being that person if you're mm-hmm. struggling because right. you're not. It's ultimately you, I definitely have the ability to overcome any, any, any challenges, roadblocks that are in your right. way. And another thing that I was going to say is that my, um, uh, my classes that I had uh-huh. for my IEP, I would right. see a lot. I would see a lot of these kids who had similar issues just give up. And right, it would break my heart, and I'm like, "You have the ability mm-hmm. to to become an AP scholar and stuff like that." 
Right. Because I was once like that. I, I once came from the bottom of the barrel to ultimate AP scholar. Right. And it's not impossible. It's not. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no. It's hard to figure out what you need to do at first. It's right. But to associate yourself with the right materials and in right environment, it's that's the first step. Right. And everybody has the ability to overcome their roadblocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I've always kept the idea in my head that, you know, at, at least in a realistic sense, you know, there's nothing that I can or cannot do and that it's really up to me to decide how I choose to run my run my life. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's like at the end of the day, it's not uh, these challenges that control me. It's me who controls them. Absolutely. I was so, waiting for something like that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's like, I'll, I appreciate your hints and stuff. So it's like, good job on getting it out of me. But, you know, <laughs> at the same time, I'll just say it's it's like, you know, there's, there's so much uh, uh, stuff uh, that comes from, uh, you know, dealing with autism and dealing with ADHD that I've appreciated, and I'm sure you've appreciated too. Uh, that um, has helped us in life probably more actually than the average person does yeah. just because again, like I mentioned earlier, they don't deal with this stuff exactly. as a result, they, they, they can't prepare themselves for what's exactly. coming. And so as a result, I think that, um, you know, makes dealing with these, this stuff all the more valuable and just all the more helpful and just, you know, interesting. Yeah. And it's like, is it, does it make my life any easier? No, it does the opposite. But at the same time, if, if it leads to this kind of stuff, I'm willing to take on that challenge at the same time, because Mm -hmm. to me, it's like, I, I want to be the best version of myself. And it's like, at the same time, the fact that I have this as a part of me to work with, I see that in the best eyes possible. Yeah. Yeah. I would totally 100% agree with that. Yeah, no. And I definitely, um, and I definitely, um, think at least in your case, you know, for you, given everything we talked about regarding your, your story, you know, it's like for you, it shares special meaning, I feel almost yeah. because, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a case where it's like, this stuff is part of my life, but at the same time, it doesn't control my life to the very last detail. And I'm not saying this, this is what happens for you, but at the same time, you've talked about how taking medication every day and, you know, playing sports so much, you know, being on a basketball team, it's like all this stuff that you see every day in your life, it's been so helpful in dealing with something that's constantly been there for you from the very beginning. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you even just said it right there. It's the, how it, I've learned from these lessons, mm-hmm. but these issues are not issues. These challenges don't define me. Right. It's how I use my, my drive to mm-hmm. want more to to uh dictate my future it's it's not obviously my challenges will be roadblocks but right it, I'll, I'll be able to to get through them and then right. once i have real life roadblocks from right. outside my control i can more efficiently get through them because right. i know i know what it's like to get through a roadblock Right. Yeah. And obviously that's led to a lot of accomplishments and I'm sorry to brag on you here, but I'll just let our audience know now, Nikki has actually been accepted into, I think like at least 10 schools already and like, you know, getting close to like 15 or stuff. And there's some <laughs> good schools on that list. Cause I looked and it, it's like, you know, it, I, I guess what I'm, I'm leading towards here is like, if you looked at this, this guy's, you know, uh, resume, you know, in terms of what he's done in his life, uh, in terms of academic and, you know, just life accomplishments, you would probably not expect ADHD in the first place. But at the same time, the fact that you had, you were able to do all this with ADHD makes it all the more amazing. The more, the more challenging part though, was the reading and comprehension disorder. And in, in right. multiple of these, to- like when, with, without my meds or mm. with my meds, my reading comprehension is, is the same. That's yeah. just from my ADHD. So that that's also one of the uh, yeah again and it's like hey again if somebody was looking at what you've accomplished they wouldn't expect you they wouldn't suspect you'd have that too and if you told them uh, at least in my case i'd be like oh man this kid is good (laughs) well but what about you with your
SAT score. Stop it, man. This is my show. I get to control it. <laughs> but uh, oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. No, and I'll just say, say now since he, he uh, spilled the beans, I did get it on the SAT. <laughs> But that's, uh, that's some that's unbelievable. I cannot even wrap my head around that. It's just like, wow. I'll, I'll, I'll just close with this for our audience. You know, being on the spectrum uh, means you get very good uh, academic performance. <laughs> we'll just put it that way. OK, you know, if that's what people are going to get people to, uh, you know, appreciate it more, I'll let it be that <laughs> even if I. Even if in my heart, I don't think that's right, but yeah. whatever. <laughs> um, but anyway, man, I just want to say thank you for so much for joining us today. You know, please stay in touch with the show and we'd love to have you on again real soon. You know, you were an awesome guest today and um, I'm sure our audience will really, as really appreciate listening to your story at all. Like I said, it's very insightful, very amazing, you know, and just uh, so much to learn from it too. And then I also want to thank our subscribers and listeners for joining us today. If you'd like to, look for more great content then please go to our website at www.sportsonthespectrum.net and then for all of you out there don't forget the three rules of life stay safe have fun get dirty and from sports on the spectrum i'm keegan flegner saying so long and i will see you all on the next episode of sports on the spectrum thank you